Hello everyone and welcome to From Kubernetes to PaaS to Developer Control Planes. My name is Daniel Bryant, I'm the Director of DevRel at Ambassador Labs and you can find me on most of the interwebs at, at Daniel Bryant UK. Now I'm going to discuss over the next 20 minutes these high level key points. I believe as a cloud native community, as a DevX days community, we need to focus more on treating our platforms that we deploy applications onto as a product. I'm gonna argue we should realize that you can't have good DevX without good UX. And when I say good UX, I mean proper UX, not just like back-end engineer UX that I typically do, proper UX. And we need to focus on the workflows and the tooling interoperability. And this is where this notion of developer control planes will come into their focus more clearly. Now we're being told increasingly to shift left as developers, right? Now, this is not a new thing. I started my career in Java development, JavaScript development back in 2001, 2002 timeframe. And we were being asked then to think about the illities early on in the process. We used to call them non-functional requirements. Not a great name, right? Really, it's cross-functional requirements. It's things like reliability, scalability, security, all this good stuff, right? The challenge was back then, there wasn't great abstractions, there wasn't great APIs, there wasn't great tooling to help us. And this led to fragmentation, you know, devs doing just this thing, ops doing just this thing, infosec doing just this thing. And it kind of meant for a lot of handoffs and a lot of muddles, all the good stuff you've heard in books like Accelerate, DevOps Handbook, these are real challenges back in the day, right? Now I think we've got a lot more options. You know, massive hat tip here to the CNCF, there's lots of projects out there now. The only challenge is we've almost gone the other way in that tool sprawl is an issue for shifting left. We all know the value of thinking about security early, but there's lots of different tools. We all know the value of thinking about deployability, reliability early, but again, there's lots of tools. And it's easy to poke fun right at the CNCF landscape. We all like to do a cheap shot at KubeCon, right? Let's be honest though, this is a sign of a healthy community. Lots of divergence, lots of innovation going on. It does mean it's challenging for us to pick which tools are going, you know, are going to be useful to us, but it's still a sign of a healthy community. The only slight snag with, you know, KubeCons, and I am missing not being there in person in KubeCon, hopefully soon, right? But each KubeCon doesn't help with this tool sprawl. And CEO of Ambassador Labs, Richard, and I regularly joke on this kind of thing, that every KubeCon brings innovation, brings conversations, brings discussions, brings more tools and tools are somewhat like tribbles in the Star Trek uniform, uh, universe, right? So let's take a step back for a moment, uh, look at my career and the control planes I was used to using as a developer, how my cognitive load varied over times and how difficult I found the job, uh, basically. And I think this relates very much to the developer experience that I had available to me at the time. So looking back at my dev career, and apologies for a bit of a data dump table, uh, this is the best way I could find to animate it, but very briefly I'll step through. In the early 2000s, I was working on Java monoliths, uh, deploying in-house, actually for the UK government when I was working there for a bit, and I just thought about coding, right? 2005 time, I was doing more enterprise-y kind of development, a classic SOA, service-oriented architecture, moved into um, racking and stacking some of the tin. There was even cloud emerging around this time, right? Amazon uh, with AWS, with uh, SQS and S3 were popping up on the scene. And I was excited by this. I started learning more not only about coding, but about shipping and even limited degrees of running applications, how to pixie boot servers, how to use Chef to deploy you know, Java, the JVM on the machines. And around 2010 time, I actually went and did a bunch of work in Ruby and Rails, Heroku, doing some Java work on Cloud Foundry. And this was a very different experience, proper, you know, classic platform as a service. My life as a developer was super easy, right? It was literally CF, create route, or, you know, git push to Heroku. And that was all I had to think about. You know, maybe I looked in a new Relic dashboard to do a bit of observability. Maybe I could look at the logs if something was going wrong. But as a developer, I didn't think too much about the, the CI CD aspect of what I was doing. Microsoft's services came along right, 2012 ish time, pick, pick a date. Um, but then new options were available to us modularizing our architecture, designing for replaceability. Docker popped up, Kubernetes popped up. Suddenly as a developer, you know, I was working as a consultant in London, there was suddenly a lot of things to learn as a full stack engineer. Everything from new languages, all the way through to databases, to queues and distributed logs, to Terraform, to Chef, to Puppet. You know, there's a lot of things to learn as a developer. And in 2020, 
now we sort of come full circle, you know, microservices plus plus, we're looking for that PaaS like experience once again. Kubernetes is the foundation, but maybe we're missing that sort of top layer uh, to make it easier for developers to provide that good developer experience, right? And again, I think a lot of engineers now would recognize themselves as full lifecycle developers. We'll cover that a bit more in a minute, but you're responsible for, you know, taking the business ideas, coding them, shipping them, and running them as well. You know, you build it, you run it, Verden Vergels famously said, I see this in many organizations we work with at Ambassador Labs. Now, if I'm gonna map on my cognitive load over the years as a developer. It's an interesting graph, I think, right? You can see in my early years, you know, I was obviously learning a lot, fresh out of college, fresh out of university, but it was, you know, I was pretty happy, right? I created my Java app, packaged it in a jar or a war artifact, put it into a portal or handed it off to ops and, you know, stuff happened, right? Happy days. As I got into more SOA, I was spinning up tin, I was racking and stacking, but even if I didn't want to go that deep in the infra, I kind of enjoyed it, but even if I didn't want to go that deep, I was still having to think about things like application service, enterprise service buses, more kind of infrastructure kind of components. And I was like, you know, this is kind of a lot more complicated, right? Going to the world of Heroku and Cloud Foundry was a breath of fresh air, right? You know, so much simpler as a developer, focus more on my code, more on, you know, when things were going wrong in production, having a look around the logs and things. I really enjoyed using these passes. Now, obviously applications, user demands got more complicated, more complex. This is when I think, you know, the cognitive load just shot through the roof. Granted, I didn't have to learn all the tools, but the consultancy I was working with at the time, was a fantastic team, Open Credo, I'll shout them out. We were deliberately going in and helping folks embrace new technologies. So we're having to learn all these new things. But yeah, again, as a full stack developer, the DevX was not there. The developer experience is not there. I was constantly context switching between all the different tools. So what did I learn through my time, you know, my 20 year journey in IT? Treating platform as a product is key. Now, I saw this obviously in Heroku. I saw this in Cloud Foundry, the folks behind those uh, platforms clearly invested in things like UX, product management, project management, all this good stuff. And even companies I worked at, and I'll shout out Not On The High Street, uh, UK online marketplace, myself and Nick Jackson, a bunch of other awesome folks worked there and built a platform on Mesos at the time. We really thought about our platform as a product and it really showed in terms of adoption and user experience. It wasn't perfect, but it was a lot better than other places I've worked where the platform was an afterthought or it was just ops responsible for it and developers had to put up with what we were, we were given. I also learned you can't have good DevX without good UX, right? I mean, Twitter Bootstrap was a miracle at the time, right? Me as a backend engineer when Twitter Bootstrap came on as a UX tool, like as, a, as a kind of CSS collection uh, on, on JavaScript and things, made my life designing UIs much easier. But still, I, I was a backend developer, right? I wasn't a good um, user experience developer. I worked with some amazing UX folks and I really dialed into the value of, of UX. And again, we're treating the platform like a product Good DevX requires good UX. And I learned to focus on the workflows. And I think HashiCore, to be honest, like Mitchell and Amon, the whole team, I've been very lucky to see their journey right from day zero, pretty much. They really taught me this. You know, when I first bumped into Terraform, as an example, I was a bit confused, you know, different stanzas, different configs for different clouds, where's the value? But I soon learned the magic was in the workflow the Terraform plan, the Terraform apply, the general modular structure that emerged over the time. It's like, ah, consistent workflow is the key here. There's only a little bit of extra cognitive load to learn the different configs. Now, tooling interoperability was really key too. I saw this in my Java days, uh, you know, things that worked well in my, in my world that plugged into my IDEs, and we're of course seeing this with VS Code these days, right? This tooling interop is a really key thing for reducing the friction for developers. There's always a Kelsey Hightower tweet for any occasion in Kubernetes, right? Because he's, he's awesome, basically. <laughs> and this tweet I thought was perfectly relating to what we're just discussing now. And this is, you know, it's a couple of years old, this tweet now, but Kelsey was saying the delta between Kubernetes and a developer-friendly PaaS is where the next layer of value is and where things are, tend to get opinionated, a, require, a requirement for reliable end-to-end -end workflows. And I think we still, even though this is like a 2019 tweet, we still haven't really got that developer friendly pass yet. Some folks are clearly on the path trying both internally and as a product, but I think this tweet captures what I'm trying to say today, like thinking about the platforms as products, as passes that we all want. So let's look at the three things I mentioned, platform as a product, 
Now, learned a lot from Dave Studio over the years. Dave's awesome. He's done various CTO roles. He's keynoted at KubeCon in the past. And I know there's a lot of text on this slide, but I'll just paraphrase by saying I had some great chats with um, Dave at previous KubeCons. And he came up to the Ambassador Labs booth one time and said, oh, you know, fantastic talk by Pinterest. They were using the Spinnaker tool and they created a wrapper around Spinnaker to make it easy for their engineers to deploy code. And then he said, you know, they had a UX designer, they had project managers, they had back end people, front end folks. And poor Dave at the time, like had a couple of engineers to, to run a platform at his company. And Dave and his team were doing a great job, but they were simply limited by the resources they had, right? And it really made me think, you know, with the limited resources Dave had, he focused on centralizing processes, building in more standardized and opinionated ways of doing things to reduce friction and improve DevX. And I thought, that's awesome, right? proper lean startup approach, limited resources, but thinking about standardization opinions and trying to decentralize some of these efforts too. The go-to book in my mind in this space is Team Topologies. I'm very lucky to know Matthew and Manuel. I've worked with them on various projects in the past. They are legit folks. This book is, you know, it's not a massive book. It's quite a very readable book, but it is the best resource I think for thinking about how to build teams to offer platforms as a service, not necessarily PaaS, but platforms as a service within your organizations, whether they're big or small. And it gives you lots of great jumping off points to understand how to treat platforms as products, as services, and how to actually manage those as well. I always say start small, get big, right? And I've definitely worked on a few projects, kind of as a consultant, we're brought in to try and save the projects. Uh, and these, these are platform projects in, in big companies. I won't share any names, but we'd often join the project and I'd realized that there's been no iteration. The platform folks building the platform had not even talked to the developers. Oh, chaos ensued, right? So this book is a great reference for how to start small, iterate, learn, get big. Can't recommend it enough if you're, you know, wanting to understand the use cases your developers have in your uh, organization to help craft the platform that you should build. Just uh, almost great timing, right? Nikki, I've learned a lot from Nikki over the years, Nikki Wrightson, uh, FT.com, uh, Skyscanner recently. And she was saying, uh, she quote tweeted a really interesting thread about building platforms. And then she was arguing, you know, I strongly believe that companies need to invest heavily in platforms and the platforms need to be staffed properly, treated as products, right? And again, folks like Nikki and, and Gergely here are talking about this, Dave, other folks, right? There's smart people talking about interesting things. I'm always interested. I think treating platforms as products is really, really key. Staffing them accordingly, setting goals, iterating accordingly. Point number two, you can't have good DevX without good UX, right? Now, shout out to the Argo project. I've been lucky enough to play around with Argo for a couple of years now. Argo is growing all the time as many things, but in particular, Argo CD is a fantastic UI for understanding your current deployment state in Kubernetes and embracing GitOps to deploy things, you know, to finding Git reconciled into Kubernetes. Now, I've been lucky enough to chat to many of the uh, Intuit folks, the BlackRock folks, the Red Hat folks behind Argo. Did a great podcast with Alex M uh, on the Argo project. So I'll put the links down there you can check out. And Alex really helped me understand about the value of the UI of Argo. You know, almost put aside the GitOps benefits, put aside some of these other benefits that he said the UI is really useful in big enterprises for helping them build their mental model of, of how deployments work. What is a node? What's deployed where? When we're doing canaries, rolling upgrades, what's going on? It's a great tool to help developers build their mental model. And that is key in DevX. Following on from this, you know, not just UI, right? The CLI of Argo rollouts is fantastic. I constantly use this in my demos, right? It's like a watch command as the canaries are going out. You see new pods spinning up. You see traffic being rerouted and you see pods being spun down when the canary is successful. And the UX of it is just fantastic, right? It's a CLI tool, but it's fantastic. People have clearly put time and energy and iterated on this user experience. It's great developer experience. So good UX for platforms. I bumped into this book quite a few years ago now. It's a great read. It's a kind of chunky read in some ways, but it talked about affordances, personas, a bunch of things that I've really used as I've helped teams build platforms now. The classic, of course, Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think. We still discuss this in Ambassador Labs quite a bit. It's a great book, again, for thinking about personas and many of the good UX things that perhaps we as back engineers, back end engineers don't always think about. So do think personas. User research is key. 
Can't reiterate that one enough. I've, I've too many times as a consultant brought in to save a platform build. And then, you know, as soon as I ask the question, like, what do your developers actually want from the platform? And if the lead engineer on the platform team said, oh, we haven't talked to the developers or we're going to give them what, what they need. I was like, uh oh, this project's probably doomed. If you're not listening to your customers, your users, you're never going to deliver value for them. It will simply get sidelined or people will work around it. And do watch your users in their daily tasks using your tools. Constant surprises at Ambassador Labs, people, you know, going through and using our tools in ways we never thought possible, and um, things that we thought were simple and obvious and not to them and, and vice versa. So actually watching people jumping on a Zoom in our case and, you know, asking folks to step through quick starts and tutorials, look at telepresence, look at emissary ingress. We learn so much from doing that and we're humbled all the time, right? So I thoroughly, you know, encourage you to think about developer experience by actually watching some developers experience your tools. Workflows and interops. So this is an interesting one, right? I've learned a lot from the Netflix folks over the last sort of few years on this. And yep, I know we're not all Netflix, right? But they're often at the vanguard. They're often leading the way. I like to look at what they're doing. Sort of in a few years time, the rest of us might be following suit, right? And they talk a lot about this full life cycle uh, developer notion. Not every developer at Netflix is full life cycle, but a lot of them are and that they own the idea all the way through to code delivery and production. And there's clear workflow steps, there's clear interoperability between their tools and nice separation of concerns on the different steps. And I, they've really put a lot of energy in, into thinking and iterating on this workflow and how the tools are pluggable and how the tools interoperate very successfully. Other great blog posts there by Gallo Navarro here, fantastic write-up of building a pass for five, uh, 1,500 engineers. Similar kind of discussions, right? It's always about trade-offs. You've got to balance that DevX with, you know, um, flexibility of platform, governance, security, these kind of things. But um, it's a great discussion of, of, of thinking about all these trade-offs. We as platform engineers, we as developers, right? We want to think about when we're building and using platforms. And I've got to quote SVP of engineering at Ambassador Labs. I had some great chats with Bjorn over the years and we did a podcast recently and he pulled out this really key thinking point for me. You know, he's seen many things in his time at New Relic, at Envision. He's been working in the industry for many years. Lots of great experience running teams of all sizes, remote, you know, on-prem, these things as well. And he was saying the industry is going through waves of expansion and waves of consolidation. And he wasn't exactly sure where we're at in, in the cloud native space at the moment, but he did say in times of consolidation, you end up with products that integrate with lots and lots of tools, specifically the tools you use. And that made me think back to my Java days where we had well-defined workflows, tools that interoperated, tools that we could swap out because there was common standards in this space, right? And I was like, ah, yeah, I think you're on something, Bjorn. This could be where a lot of innovation is going on within the CNCF, within the cloud native space at the moment, right? With standards emerging, you know, custom resources, and um, various sort of interop standards, like cloud events is a kind of you know, standard way of defining events in a cloud native system. So where are we now? Well, it's interesting, right? I'm totally standing on the shoulders of giants in this presentation. I've been lucky enough to chat to Cheryl Hung, Mario Lorio, Casper Nissen, just to mention a few folks here. And there's a few key themes I want to pull out that they all seem to mention now. Cheryl, kind of in, in looking at the developer experience of Cloud Native, she talked a lot about the value of having service catalogs, having a good UI. And she mentioned Spotify's Backstage, which we've many of us have heard of, I'm sure. Mario talked about enabling self-service for developers being opinionated, but you know, allowing them to break out if, if necessary, but that self-service is key. And Casper talked about things, thinking around the mechanics, the workflow. Kubernetes is almost a given, he was saying. It's the next layer up of managing promotion of code through environments, implementing GitOps in a way that developers can understand and manage these kind of things. So I put links there, all, the, all these links uh, go into the podcast, more details. I've learned a bunch from these folks, so thank you very much to them to, to help build my knowledge. Key insights, successful organizations are investing in platforms and platform teams. YAML, pretty much the lingua franca of cloud config, although I think we're seeing more and more auto generation of YAML now. Uh, something we're looking into a lot in Basta Labs because YAML's rather verbose to keep constantly writing yourself, right? I'm gonna say a good UI paints a thousand CLIs. You know, I'm not saying don't show the CLI any love, right? I'm a big CLI user, but particularly in large enterprise context, a really good user experience, a really good portal dashboard service catalog takes you a long way 
in terms of developer experience. Some folks are just simply happier in the UI. GitOps is sort of becoming, I think, the protocol, the standard workflow, best practice for deployment, the reconciliation mode. Massive hat tip, of course, to the Weaveworks folks for all the great work they're doing. Uh, Cornelia Davis has done some great presentations talking about this reconcile loop that you know is in Kubernetes and that GitOps builds on. And um, so uh, this, I think, is is key to a lot of future DevX. This notion of GitOps for deployment. And lastly, you know, adopting the Kubernetes resource model enables interop, using things like custom resources, defining your own custom resources, and treating the entities within Kubernetes as they should be used. Uh, just the other day, Jason Morgan from Buoyant and I were doing a demo of integrating two CNCF projects, LinkD and MSRE Ingress. And because both the projects treated all the Kubernetes entities as you think they would, like and emissary ingress routes the services, link D augments services. It was literally a one line piece of config to get the tools working well together. Whereas in the past, there's been, you know, when we've used different service meshes or different ingresses, there's been a lot more config needed to work around different ways things were using Kubernetes or, or, or not using Kubernetes is the case. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it wasn't a great developer experience when you had to kind of do all these patches and work, work away, workarounds. It sometimes provided more flexibility, but it's always a trade-off, right? Good developer experience, easy integration versus that more power. So this, I think, in summary, is the role of the developer control plane, right? I've talked about coding, shipping, running. I think, you know, we, ops have had their control planes for a long time. I think it's now time where we need this developer control plane. Probably a thin UI on top, service catalog, that kind of thing. Some kind of protocol mechanism. I've talked about GitOps being that. I think Git is pretty much like being accepted as the single source of truth now regardless of whether we're in the coding stage, the shipping stage, or the run stage, right? You think code is obvious in Git, ship, you know, you're in your Argo CD, your Argo rollouts, all in uh, config in Git, and even run, defining mappings to your backend services via ingress or service mesh. That's all CRDs, right? That's all code, config, stored in Git, triggered through with GitOps to actually being deployed. So I think this developer control plan is a powerful concept. It's similar to things like, you know, open application model are probably worth exploring or, or definitely worth exploring too. If you sort of squint, there's a little bit of the developer control plane here. I think many of us are converging to this kind of model, if you like, of how um, developers should interact with platforms. So wrapping up, what's next for platforms? I think we as, you know, DevX Days community, as a cloud native community, really need to think about treating platforms as a product. This is exactly what I said at the start, but if you resource them, set the goals accordingly, iterate on them, platforms this built this way provide so much more value, minimize the friction, provide better developer experience. And you do have to realize that you can't have good developer experience without good user experience, right? Good UX. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> you know, don't uh, learn from my mistakes, don't follow my mistakes, and um, invest in getting expert opinion on, on user experience. Engage with your target users, your, your key personas. And I think focus on the workflows and the tooling interoperability. This is where, like, you know, lots of interesting thinking around developer control planes at the moment, how things interop. This, I think, is going to be an area of active research, active products, and, and consolidation of things over the next few, few years. I'll say thank you at that point. You can find me on the interwebs here, email, Twitter, also on the Ambassador Lab Slack. You can find the references to the podcast I mentioned down below. And of course, I've got to mention we're hiring, right? If you like what you've seen today, please come and join me. Thanks a lot.